I'm Lou Crooks, and I'd like to welcome you back to our adventures as we explore the science that can be resolved to Scripture to support the authority of God's Word. Before we go there, please join me in prayer. Father, we uh, praise you as the creator and controller of all things. I confess that I'm guilty of, and, and I think many are guilty of, not glorifying you for all we see. Sometimes we just grow complacent. Thank you for your grace in showing and telling us about your great works in all things. And I ask you to help us see what you have to tell us in, in this lesson so that we can men mentor others, encouraging their own confidence in the authority of your word. I lift these things to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this is welcome to our second in session in our, on our exploration of the science behind that can be resolved to scripture. And I'd like to remind you, or at least ask you to remember what we're here for. First, so that you can be ready to explain, give a defense for, answer questions about what it is you believe and why you believe it. That would help you build the confidence, not only in your faith, but in the faith of others that you know. And please remember to tell it to the kids. The children don't hear anything but what mainstream science wants them to hear in school, and it's always to build one particular agenda. If it doesn't agree with that agenda, they don't hear it. So only by investigating and hearing this other science that we're going to be talking about are you going to be able to show the kids that there's other things they can research and use their own brains to think through things and come up with true answers and for any unbelievers that might be watching I'd ask you to accept the challenge of investigating the truth but only behind the things I'm telling you but the truth behind God's word, the Bible, and the salvation message it brings. Today we're going to be talking about worldview, inerrancy, science, and then we'll get to some evidence, or at least an introduction to some evidence that will start building this um, support for the authority of Scripture. These are all concepts that impact our understanding of the Bible. But before we get into that, let's go back to our dinosaur friends from session one to get us kicked off. Mm -hmm. 
We have to figure that out from the clues that we find. We never have enough clues. So, our starting points usually lead us to different conclusions. Here's how I see it. I think this dinosaur died over 100 million years ago. It dried out in the sun for a long time. Uh, and later, I think this specimen was uh, covered by river set, uh, which was caused by a local flood. So we rely on all this time to wind up around. Where Kim sees millions of years, I see evidence of a different history. I believe this animal died in a flood, but it wasn't a local flood. It was a massive flood that covered the earth, Noah's flood, when God judged the world. The carcass was buried suddenly, before it could be eaten or decomposed, buried in a layer of sediment that stretches across the entire continent. Since the flood, according to the Bible, was about 4,300 years ago, that's how old we come to different conclusions because of our different starting points. I start with the Bible, my colleagues do. If we all have the same facts, we merely interpret the facts differently because of our different starting points. So what is your starting point? You may never have even thought about it, but we all have them. The starting point is your worldview. An interesting word. It comes from German philosophy, and it's being used a lot today in Western culture to describe what's going on. Everybody has a worldview. It's as unique as a fingerprint, and it's at the very core of your thinking. It's a set of presuppositions that you have, which may or may not be provable, which may or may not be true. They may only be partially true. They may be totally false. But they still are what you base your thinking on. And everybody's, as I said, is as unique as their fingerprint. It's been said that Conceiving of Christianity as a worldview is one of the most significant developments in the faith in recent times. Because we got to realize that it's at the very core, our thinking is based on this. And if we understand that Christianity and the Bible that tells us what Christianity all is, is where that thinking starts, then we come to different conclusions, just as our video clip said, than if we use other books like science books. Basically, the worldview is a fundamental orientation of the heart on which we live and move and have our very being. So, what is the effect of your worldview? Again, it's the very foundation. And it's like an iceberg. You don't even see that worldview, and others don't see it in you. But what do they see? Well, maybe they see what you believe in, especially if you share it with them. But on top of your beliefs are your values. What are the things that are important to you? Now people start seeing the iceberg coming out of the water. They especially do when they judge your actions, when they see what you're involved in, where you go, what you watch, what you talk about. And they see it in your character. So, your worldview, the things you don't think about and may not even be true, lead all the way up to how people might rely on you for, for any particular thing as they define themselves in your character. Bottom line here is that the worldview is the basis of authority on which everything you do 
is, is, comes from. And you got to think about this. I've actually challenged people when they come up and say, well, I believe such and such. And I say, whoa, whoa, let me ask you, what is your basis of authority for what is right and wrong? Because that's coming out of their worldview. And they can't even sometimes answer that question. Let's get, really the point though is that the effect of your worldview controls pretty much who you are and what you do. Your worldview answers key questions. Again, you may not think about them, but I think we all have some form of these questions in us. Where did we come from? Through the course of our studies, we're basically going to only look at two options about where we came from. But your worldview answers that question. Who are we? Why are we here? Another version of the same question. What's gone wrong with the world? You may have asked that a lot lately when you see some of the things that are going on on, in the news. What can we do to fix it? We think we can fix the climate change issue. And it's possible we can impact it. But we're still back to those fundamental worldview questions. So that's what we're going to look at is ways in which worldview can answer some of these questions. At the very core of a biblical worldview, what we talked about in lesson in our first session as the ultimate presupposition is the idea that God exists and the Bible is his word. So, let's talk, first talk about God's existence. There's a, a lot of arguments, a lot of discussion or proofs out there that lend themselves to say that there is a God. And some people wouldn't argue with them here or there. One of them is called the trademark argument. This is one for philosophers. And it's the only one of those deep philosophical ones that I can explain. But basically it goes like this. If you can conceive of the notion that there is an ultimate supreme being, then that ultimate supreme being must have put the idea in your head that he exists. And since he's greater than your mind, he exists. Again, this is a philosopher thing, and it might kind of give you a headache. But that's one of the philosophical arguments for the existence of God. The others get a little more, um, a little easier to grasp. The cosmological argument says that there is some uncaused first cause to existence. And even the people who want us to go back to the Big Bang Theory admit that there was a starting point and they really aren't sure what caused that starting point. So the cosmological arguments say, well, it was God. A logical or moral argument, these are similar and both of them say there is a universal code of logic. Certain logic always holds or certain morality always holds Therefore, since it's universal, there must be a lawgiver that sets logic or morality. Then there's one you really can't argue with, the personal testimony. If you talk to a Christian who, who has a personal relationship with Christ, they're going to be able to tell you things that have happened in their lives that demonstrate there is a God. They may be miraculous healings. They may just be comfort. But they're going to tell you about a direct interface. I personally had a heart stent operation. And I felt a hand on my shoulder before the doctor gave me the first anesthetic or started the procedure telling me everything was going to be okay. And then there's two others that we all can see. 
No matter what your faith position, you can see these. There's God's general revelation, which is nature, period. It's all the things around us, everything that exists in the world. God's general revelation to us. And then his special revelation, which is the Bible. So let's talk about those two in a little bit more detail first. As I say, God created everything and we can see it day to day. Paul told us in Romans that because we can see this, we can see God's, some invisible qualities of God, his divinity and his power. And that we were that, without excuse to understand that he existed just from that. The special uh, revelation is the Bible. It starts off, Genesis 1, with in the beginning, and it goes on to tell us what God created, and at another point, we get to Paul's letter to Timothy, where it says, all scripture, and specifically Paul was talking at that point about what we call the Old Testament today, but all scripture is God-breathed. In other words, inspired by God to give us truth. So it's a special revelation. Now, there's an interesting concept that was put out by a guy named um, Stephen Jay Gould, paleontologist. He's no longer with us. He's passed away. And he was not a Christian. He tried to come up with a compromise solution called non-overlapping magisteria, which said... Everything that we can see in the real world and demonstrate as fact is that magisteria of reality. And everything in the metaphysical world, which we can't demonstrate as fact, and he put in there things like ethics and values, among other things, do not overlap. He would also put in there, by the way, religion or the spiritual world. And he said, those do not overlap. But when it comes to worldview questions, the Bible and the real world definitely do overlap. And the single greatest demonstration of that is the life of Jesus Christ. He was born of a virgin, which is not anything you can demonstrate in the real world is ever happening. There's no such thing that we've ever documented as asexual human reproduction. He showed who he was, was through signs and wonders, which were all miracles, and again, they overlapped with the real world, even though there was no real world cause that anybody could see, and of course, his resurrection from the dead. So, Again, with worldview questions, with worldview questions, science and the Bible are definitely overlapping. God wrote this love letter to us. It's called the Bible. 66 books, over 40 human authors, spanning some 15 to 1600 years. The Bible is self-authenticating. In other words, it tells you who wrote it. We looked at the verse um, in Timothy, all scripture is God breathed. And in Peter, it tells us that no prophecy ever arose from the will of a man. They all came from God. The Bible is self-attesting. In other words, this has got two dimensions. In other words, number one, the things it says that happens, it goes and tells you how they happened later. In other words, the fulfillment of prophecy. But in another way, the Bible's self-attesting in that it does say who wrote it. And we need to believe that's who wrote it. Let's look at some other ancient manuscripts in history that are pretty interesting. The Gaelic Wars by Julius Caesar. How many copies 
of ancient manuscripts are there, are there of that document? The answer is about 10. Yet nobody doubts Julius Caesar really wrote the book because it says in there he did. The Iliad by Homer. Well, there's more copies of that. There's about 1,700. But still, that says Homer wrote it, and we believe it. Well, there's 5,800 plus copies of the New Testament in ancient manuscripts. Why would we doubt that if we don't doubt 10, we don't doubt 1,700? Why would we doubt 5,800? So the Bible is self-attesting. The Bible is about, the first three say people, events, and places. But those are all history. The Bible is definitely a history book. Let's look at a few of the dimensions of that historicity of the Bible to see what I'm talking about. First off, transmission. Transmission of Scripture, according to the Jewish tradition, was a very meticulous process. The scribes, and they made one mistake on a scroll. The scroll was gone. They threw it away. They didn't have any whiteout. They didn't have any way to correct it. They threw it away. And this became, this was standard for thousands, thousands of years. The Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in the 1940s, but date back to one to 200 years before Christ, have almost a complete scroll of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah in the Bible. And that scroll matches to the 95th plus percentile, the Masoretic text of the Bible, written in Hebrew, that we have that dates to the 900 BCs. So, for over a thousand years, we have a 95% plus correlation between these ancient texts and less ancient texts. There aren't any changes. And that most of the changes that show up are because the Jewish tradition became to add vowel marks into the, into the scripture. The original Hebrew is all consonants. And those vowel marks changed. They weren't even in the original Isaiah text. It was all consonants. So that less than 5% difference is a lot made up just of those vowel marks. This accuracy um, from over 100 years before Christ to over to the 900s after Christ implies that there was an awful lot of accuracy from the original texts to those ones found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that the Essenes stored. Documentary evidence. The Elba tablets, which go back over 2,000 years, show use of patriarchal words, the same words that we see in the first five books of the, of the Bible, the same kinds of words, and the same names. The Old Testament and ancient texts align on slave prices, tribute given, religious practices, and law between the Old Testament books we have and the extra-biblical documents we've found. They seem to support each other. Extra-biblical records confirm king's lists and conflicts within ancient Israel. And these are from countries that were in conflict with Israel, and they weren't just Israeli. But even inside Israel, you can find extra-biblical documentation of things that support the Bible. Um, we were in Israel in 2006, and we went to Tel Dan, where there's a stele that talks about King David, one of the first Hebrew extra-biblical sources that actually mentioned him, and certainly calls into question those who say King David didn't really exist, it's all just a story. Archaeology. Let's look at a couple things there. Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we haven't for sure found those two cities. There's a lot of people who claim they have found them, but they haven't. 
But what we do know is at the north end of the Dead Sea in Israel, there's at least five cities that have got severe heat damage, which would line up with the scriptural account of Sodom and Gomorrah. The account of Jericho in the book of Joshua talks about blowing the trumpets and the walls coming down. And now that they have just, they've dug up those walls, they found out that they really did fall outward. They weren't knocked inward by an army. They fell outward and then were burned. Again, that's what the Bible tells us. Jerusalem. In Samuel, the book of Samuel, the author tells us that King David conquered the city of Jabez, where the Jebusites lived, then to become the city of David or Jerusalem, by going up the water spout. Now you go, what's that mean? Well, we're going to talk about this in a little detail in a minute, but the water spout was a way that the David's commandos could get inside the city without having to go over the walls and fight. And it's been shown to have existed through archaeology. In fact, no archaeological find has ever contradicted the Bible. New Testament confirmation. Jesus stated that Moses wrote the Pentateuch. So, if you're going to put your faith in Jesus then you've got to believe he speaks the truth. And that leads us back to Moses writing the first five books of the Bible. Other authors, Mark as well as the apostles John and Paul, cite Moses' authorship of the Pentateuch as well. In fact, the New Testament referenced at least 32 Old Testament events as real history. So, it makes the importance of the Old Testament stand out, and it does show us that the Bible is historical. Another thing that it includes is prophecy. It says up here that there are over 1,800 prophecies in, in the Old Testament, or in the Bible total. And if we look at the Old Testament, we can see that on a conservative estimate, Jesus filled over 300 prophecies. Now, depending on how they it's interpreted, some people will drive that number up towards 500. But on a conservative basis, Jesus specifically filled 300 prophecies that were made in the hundreds of years before he existed during his lifetime and ministry here on earth. Science. People will tell you that the Bible is not a science book. And it isn't a science book. But if it touches on science, it's true. Let's look at a few examples there. The creation of Adam and Eve, along with Paul's speech to the Greeks in Acts 17, tell us that all humans are of one blood. There is no such thing as race. In 2000, the Human Genome Project released its first report on sequencing of the human genome and said there is no biological difference between any race on earth. There is no, there's no basis for the concept of race. So, where the Bible touched on science, the Bible was right. Noah's flood explains the geology we see today. David showed us that they understood then what science today is telling us is the therapeutic value of music. It just... You can't say that the Bible doesn't touch on science, and where it does, it's right. Key elements of a Christian worldview. There's 11 up here, and we're not going to talk about them all today. The central one is faith alone in Christ alone. We talked about that in session one with the TNT mnemonic to remember it. It's dynamite. We've also talked today about the, abs the um, existence of God. And we've started to talk about how the Bible is his word. We're going to do a little more of that. The other six we'll pick up in future sessions.
So, back to God's word. This concept of inerrancy is an important concept. And it's one that gets marginalized by a lot of people because... Well, they don't want the Bible to be inerrant. They want to find mistakes so they can discount it. Others will try to tell you that if you try to make the Bible inerrant, you're basically in a cult. You're using, you're making it the object of worship, which that's not true either. We're just saying that the Bible is God's word and there aren't any mistakes in it. It, it originally, I mean... When this country was founded, the United States was founded, it was enough to say the word of God. But over time, we've had to add more and more descriptors till we come up with ideas like the Bible's inspired, it's moved or guided by divine or supernatural influence, it's plenary, which means it's absolute, complete in every respect, that it's verbally inspired, It consists of words, not visions, not concepts, not feelings. Words. God gave words to the human authors that put those words down on some method of recording. The Bible's infallible. It's incapable of error. It's not liable to mislead you any time. Any misleading that goes on is the way it's interpreted, not what's said. And it's free from error in the original manuscripts. As far as that goes, translations today, which may not be inerrant, are still considered to be the word of God if they are faithful representations of the originals. So these are our two big words, inerrant and infallible. So let's understand biblical authorship. This concept of inspiration. Again, 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy that all Scripture is God-breathed. Inspired by God for the good of man. And he gives us a list of four things that man can use it for. He also tells us that it was carried to man through the Holy Spirit. And as we said, that no prophecy ever came from the will of man. So, the biblical authorship is God, even though that there's a human who recorded what God inspired him to write. Okay, an autographed text. In other words, the original that that human author recorded. And this may look like it's a complicated slide to you, and it is. But the bottom line answer on this is, you're not going to find an original text. They don't exist any longer. We do have ancient manuscripts. And as we, as we move through this notional timeline of inspiration by God, that first purple over there on the side, we come up to that orange line that comes off, which is the Samaritan Pentateuch. That's the first five books of the Bible that were left behind when the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and were subsequently modified over time to be what we know as the Pentateuch today, the Samaritan Pentateuch. That starts in 500 years before Christ, but the oldest copies we have are about 300 years after Christ. No telling how many changes happened in those 800 years. And there's no, nothing that says it was those changes were God-breathed. The pink line that comes up next runs into the Septuagint. You may or may not have heard of that. You may have seen it abbreviated LXX in its Roman numerals. What is that? The Septuagint is a Greek copy, a Greek translation of the Old Testament that was was commissioned by Ptolemy. 
the Greek Pharaoh of Egypt. Interestingly enough, back to the prophecy, Ptolemy, as the Greek Pharaoh of Egypt, is one of the four kingdoms that came out of the dynasty set up by Alexander the Great. And Daniel tells us in the book of Daniel that that would happen. But that's what the Pentateuch is. And, the, and the, I mean, the, um, the Pentateuch is the first five books. The Septuagint. The Septuagint also is not inspired. Ptolemy had these these guys come in, supposedly 72 of them, so he had six from each tribe of Israel, each of the 12 tribes, and translate. But there's a lot of major differences that we find between the, the uh, Septuagint and, and the other two main manuscripts we're going to look at, which is the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Masoretic text, which seems to be the truest text to the Jewish tradition of textual transmission. The oldest Masoretic text we have is about nine, from 900 B.C. There are older copies of the Pentateuch and there are older copies of the Septuagint, but those three are the things that have most influenced the translation to the English Bible, although there are other things. What's the scriptural position on inerrancy? Well, Number one, Scripture tells us in both the Old and New Testaments, God does not lie. It tells us God's Word is true, flawless, and reliable. We can count on God's Word in any aspect of our life that it touches. It can be the foundation for our decision-making. Scripture is God's written Word. That comes out in multiple places in the Old Testament. And we've already looked at the New Testament in Timothy and Peter about uh, where that comes from. Therefore, based on these scriptural positions, we can say Scripture is inerrant, infallible, and inspired by God. Advocates of the inerrancy inerrancy doctrine through time. Well, Martin Luther certainly was when he nailed his theses to the wall in 1521 and and depended on sola scriptura, by, by scripture alone, we know these things. The Westminster Confession of Faith from England in the 1600s also came out and backed up this idea that scripture was infallible and inerrant. That idea was then picked up by the Church of Scotland, by the Presbyterian Church, and the Baptist Church. So there's there's the roots of where this came from. Then, in nineteen sixty, no, excuse me, the nineteen eighties, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy came out, where three hundred scholars biblical scholars from the United States gathered and released 24 articles backing up the inerrancy of Scripture. So the whole idea has been out there for a long time and has solid backing theologically. Inerrancy is unaffected by a lot of words. Let me run you through them real quick. Stylistic variation, as we said, over 40 authors. Each one of them had their own style. God didn't dictate scripture to them. They weren't stenographers. They weren't taking down what he said, and that became it. He superintended it. He was the overseer. But he allowed those authors to use their own personality to compose and record without error what he wanted them to say through the Holy Spirit. The different books of the Bible reflect the background of the human authors. Think about this. John was a fisherman. And if you read the books of, of 
John or first and second John, you're going to find, or Revelation even, you're going to find a simplistic writing style consistent with someone who wasn't highly educated. He was a fisherman. That's what his background was. On the other hand, Luke had been through some pretty rigorous training to become a doctor in the days of Christ around, the, around 30 to 50 A.D. And he uses much more sophisticated words. Paul was a philosopher steeped in theology, trained by the Jewish religion. And he uses some very complex ideas. Even Moses, we go back to the Old Testament, was highly trained and wrote in a different manner than many of the other prophets. Moses was trained in the courts of Pharaoh. He had an Egyptian background. So every one of these things is going to cause these personalities used and, and styles used to compose scripture to be different. But it doesn't change whether or not they're true. Translations, as I said earlier, though not fully inerrant, are the word of God in as much as that they faithfully represent the original. And again, most of the time we're going to count on the Masoretic text as being that original. It's as far back as we really can go. Differing details. Let's face it, you can read different biblical accounts. Even if we take something as simple as the Synoptic Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you'll find stories told a little bit differently. Why might that be? Well, it's generally believed by scholars that Jesus spoke Aramaic. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written in Greek. So the authors of those books were translating from Aramaic to Greek, and they chose different words sometimes to translate that Aramaic. But that doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means there's a different way of looking at it. Jesus may have also said similar things more than once, and those translations are of different times. Even though they seem to be of the same events, sometimes they're not always of the same events. An individual's unique perspective can lead to perceiving details differently. You and I may see a particular detail in a situation and prioritize it high or prioritize it low as of it being of importance. And as those authors took a particular detail of an event, they gave it a different status than another author did. So it was, it was reported different because it was sorted different. They may have also had a different viewing angle. And let's face it, if we both saw the same guy fall on the ski slopes, we might see two different ways that fall happened. We might see it from a different thing, a different perspective. I'm a ski instructor. I'm going to see it different than somebody who taught themselves how to ski. So differing details have a lot to do with what the person who's writing those details down saw. I also say that omissions of names. People will go through the biblical genealogies that, uh, that occur in Genesis and other Old Testament books and all the way up through Matthew and Luke and say, ah, there's names missing. So there's mistakes. No, not necessarily. Matthew told us. He grouped the names behind the names of the genealogy of Jesus into groups of 14 and he did it simply to show Jesus' legal claim to being from the house of David. He didn't say that it was exhaustive. So the fact that there's names missing doesn't make it a mistake. You've got to consider what the purpose of the genealogy was. And just because something got skipped doesn't prove it's an error. It may have been totally intentional, and it was inspired, so it's not wrong. Imprecise accounts. Today we've got maybe a 
over commitment to precision. And it's got to be precise the way we think it should be precise. Scripture was inspired for common people of every generation. So the use of technical or scientific language we know today to make things precise may not even be appropriate. Just because it isn't the way written the way we want to talk doesn't mean it's an error. The use of round numbers is not precise, but it does happen in Scripture. Numbers, Joshua, First Chronicles, seem to have round numbers, things rounded off to the nearest hundred when it talks about troop strengths in ancient Israel. Another fun one in Second Chronicles talks about the wash basin that was made for the priests. And it tells us that it was round and that it was its circumference was three times its diameter. And the academic today will go, well, that's not right. The circumference was pi, 3.14159265, times its diameter. But three and 3.14 are pretty close. And we don't even know that the thing was perfectly round. So maybe its circumference really was only three times. You can't necessarily call that an error in Scripture. Figurative language does not violate inerrancy. Psalms tells us the world cannot be moved. The scientists will tell you, the world's moving. It's going around the sun. That isn't what the psalmist was talking about. The psalmist was talking about that man can't change the laws God put in effect to control the world. It's a figure of speech. And just because it's a figure of speech doesn't mean it's a mistake. We do that all the time. Think about it when a guy drops back for a three in basketball and there's nobody on him. And, whoosh, and you say, man, he had all day. We didn't have all day. He had about a second and a half. But the figure of speech isn't wrong. He was left open. Isaiah talked about the four corners of the earth. Isaiah wasn't telling us that he thought the earth was a piece of paper that had four corners on it that could be folded up. He was telling us that they came, that he was talking about everywhere on the planet that humans knew about. Figurative language is not a violation of the inerrancy doctrine. And neither is observational language. Joshua tells us that the sun rises. The sun doesn't rise. The earth spins. We know that. But it's figurative language. Matthew tells us that the Queen of Sheba traveled from the ends of the earth. She didn't travel from the ends of the earth. Apparently she traveled just a few hundred miles. But from an observer's point of view, that's a long way away. And the figure of speech, the ends of the earth, transmits that accurately. It was a long way away. Again, we talked about the precision that we expect in history. Genesis and the king's lists through Kings and Chronicles in the Old Testament talk about how many years a particular person lived or served. Well, they don't tie those years to a specific day and month. So there's ambiguity in there that could measure between their life and their death up to almost two years. But that precision isn't required because of the way those years were counted. Not only that, but the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Israel counted years differently of a king's reign. So those kind of imprecision things don't violate in inerrancy. Similarly, Ezekiel, which has got probably the most specific information about events in the Old Testament, doesn't tie those events to a known historical anchor. So they're not wrong. They just aren't written the way we might write them. Finally, we get to the point 
of language. Philosophers like to tell you that the use of human language can't be inerrant. Therefore, because the Bible's written in human language, it can't be inerrant. But that's all nice for a philosopher to say, but what else do we have? God inspired the human authors to put down words to convey his message. And he chose to use that method. It can't be wrong. Limitations in a target language for translation also do not violate inerrancy. There's some things that the Greeks said that we can't say. The Greeks had multiple words for love. We have one. Those limitations don't violate inerrancy. Paraphrased reporting. Inerrancy does not demand verbatim or comprehensive reporting. Quotes from other scriptures are not always obtained by unrolling those, those fragile old scrolls and copying what was written there. They come from memory. People who are trained and who say, this is what the scroll says. And if they've got the intent right, it's not inerrant. Variations in translations to the Greek aren't mistakes, as we said in the Synoptic Gospels. They afford us the opportunity to get depth in what Jesus was trying to say. But the intent still comes out the same. There's no guarantee of exhaustive comprehensiveness either. First and Second Chronicles tells you, look, you've got to look in these other books, extra biblical references, to find out what de more details than we've included here. The Bible's got space limitations. The Bible's got time limitations. It can't do everything. John also tells us at the end of his epistle that he didn't write everything down Jesus did. That would fill volumes. Just didn't have the space. So we do not need verbatim or comprehensive reporting for it to be accurate reporting. Non-standard grammar. The rules of grammar represent the normal way of communicating within a culture. They're different between different cultures. And just because they don't follow our rules doesn't mean they're mistakes. Even if they, it was written in our language originally, which none of the Bible was, but even if it was, authors all the time break the rules of grammar for the interest of communication. They're after a different point. So we can't get overly upset about the rules of grammar. Now let's look at a cultural difference. The rules of English are not the same as the rules of Greek. And we certainly have mixed metaphors, which if you were writing an English paper, your English teacher would nail you on. It was a mistake and you're losing points. But that isn't true in the Bible. The Greeks didn't care if you used a mixed metaphor. In the same verse, Jesus describes himself as a gate and a shepherd. Those things don't go together. One's inanimate, one isn't. The mixing of gender senses. The Greeks didn't care. The Holy Spirit was talked about in a neutral sense and in a masculine sense. It doesn't make them mistakes. It makes them out of the Greek language. Don't worry about it in English. Inerrancy is defined in terms of truth, which is a property of words constructed into sentences. Not grammatical rules. Problem passages. As we said, Scripture is limited in size. The passage it gets limited by the passage of time. It gets limited by cultural changes. So it's impossible to solve all the problems that you might have in a difficult passage of Scripture. But an unsolved problem does not prove that it's a mistake. Solutions to problems may be found in the advancement of linguistics or archaeology, 
or they may never ever be interpreted again in the same way that that original author meant them to be, but that doesn't make them mistakes. Just because you can't answer a question doesn't prove it's a mistake. Let's look at a couple examples. The first one's kind of fun. The Hebrew dietary laws classified animals as clean and unclean. Unclean animals exhibit gara, the Hebrew word, that means bringing food that's been swallowed up again. When that was translated into the King James Version of the Bible, it came out as chewing the cud. So somebody reading it in English goes, oh, unclean animals chew the cud. Then how come that lists rabbits? Rabbits don't chew the cud. Mistake. No. Cows, sheep, camels, they regurgitate an idea that came out of taxonomy and chew what they've already swallowed. Rabbits don't do that. They, pro they have a process that's known as refection, and what that is is they poop it out and eat it again. But in effect, they brought it up to be chewed again. 